Library Project here in New Orleans and a professor in the anthropology department at the University of New Orleans. And this is my co-partner in crime, um, Bruce Santad Barnes. Bonsoir, bonsoir, <laughs> comme <t 'y? laughs> Um, we're excited today to um, put the work that we've done with um, Kerr Creel in conversation with some wonderful artists and scholars in New Orleans. Um, and so th thank you so much, Christina, Mona Lisa, Connie, and um, Giovanna and Marcus for being here t tonight with us. Um, before we begin, we just wanted uh, to honor the spirit of Big Queen Kim Butte of Fayaya and the Mandingo Warriors, um, who was killed last week at a repast in New Orleans East. Her death has been a huge blow to our community. Um, the Neighborhood Story Project created a book with her a number of years ago with Fayaya, and we'll miss her so much as a neighbor, a friend, and a queen whose dancing lit up everywhere she touched the ground. I just wanted to honor her spirit before we begin. Um, yeah, so Le Coeur Creole, it means the Creole heart, and um, it's a musical ethnography that Bruce and I worked on with um, the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park for a number of years, and the exhibit is up at the Cabildo until um, September 13th. The multimedia exhibit tells the history of the language, Louisiana Creole, which is one of the most endangered in the world. For those who are not familiar with Creole as a language, it was developed by West Africans who were enslaved on plantations in Louisiana in the 1700s. Some of the first mentions of the language, in fact, come from court trials of a slave rebellion in Point Coupe Parish in 1792, where there's a record of a commandant saying uh, about the people who revolted, um, I'm quoting here, it is true that they neither understand the authentic French language nor English, but all of them understand and explain themselves perfectly well in Creole, which is a mixture of their native language and a poorly pronounced and structured French, which language is not known by all French and English citizens and inhabitants of the province, but which I, the witness, know very well. Creole began to spread in the colony and throughout the 1800s and into the early 20th century, people of all colors and social backgrounds spoke it. Although it is sometimes referred to as broken French, it is its own language that has its own complete integrity, um, like any other language, and is connected to Creoles in the Caribbean and Indian Ocean. Bruce likes to say it's a Francophone language with an African head sense. In Louisiana <laughs> Creole, like others, Verbs are not conjugated. Pronouns and time markers are put in front of verbs to indicate who and what is going on in the action. But there's also no gendered pronouns in Creole. So instead of il and l in French or he and she in English, there's one word, which is li. So if Bruce speaks Creole, we would say li parle Creole. Um, but if I said I spoke Creole, we would say the same. Li uh, um, well, if we're speaking of me in the third person, um, context is important for understanding what is being said. Getting into Creole means getting into another way of knowing, and that's been a really beautiful part of doing this project. And in our exhibit, we wanted to highlight the life of one uh, Creole speaker in particular, Jean or Juan San Malo, and his community of Maroons who lived in the swamps of South Louisiana in the 1780s. We don't know very much about his early life, except that he escaped from the Darnsburg plantation on the German coast, which is a region where people still speak Creole today. Um, so I was hoping, Bruce, you would take it back to that time by singing your song, San Malo. Yes, I would be happy to. OK. Um, <laughs> I'll move over. Yeah, this is a, a song that um, we recorded, and it is the first track that's on the uh, <clears throat> CD Le Coeur Creole. Um, so it is about San Malo. Um, and, uh, you know, it came just to me at a very rapid pace, uh, riding on the wind. We happened to be in the studio recording some Creole songs, and this, this tune just uh, came in what we call air songs. Uh, so it's a song about San Malo who uh, runs into the woods. Um, and it's being chased, and uh, we can have 
probably a discussion at the end of the Q&A, probably. <laughs> San Malo, we 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 yo. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. San Malo to Kashila, so that you shall see twa. San Malo to Vienna, Lima. San Malo, we Malo, we 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 Pull it blonde to blue Grand Prix. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. San Malo, we 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 yo. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. San Malo, fe grand maenaj, ko libre les islam la ba. Yebian pasila, ko so bese la vie. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. San Malo to Kashila, so that you shall see twa. San Malo to Vienna, Lima, blue brown zombie. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. Oh, San Malo, we 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 yo. Okay, thanks so much, Bruce. Um, inspired by San Malo's life story and legacy, we've invited a group of artists, writers, and musicians to gather this evening to share their research and art practices around critical genealogies of Louisiana. Uh, Christina K. Robinson, Connie Dorsey Abdul Salam, Melissa Saloy, and Giovanna Joseph with the company as Dr. Marcus St. Julian. One of the main things that all of these artists and scholars have in common is that although their work is frequently showcased around the country, they also have maintained a strong commitment to racial justice in South Louisiana and frequently share their work in community-based settings. So um, I would like to do some introductions to each of our uh, panelists as they, they begin their talk. So I'm going to begin by um, just speaking a little bit about Christina's work and her installation, Republica, Temple of Color and Sound. I first heard about this um, amazing project by the great art critic, Eric Bukhart, who just passed away recently, um, when I was telling him about our traveling altar dedicated to San Malo. He had told me that he had just gone to an exhibit that rent is too damn high at the Res uh, Crescent City Boxing Gym, where Christina's exhibit was on display and encouraged me to go see it. In his understated way, he said that he had been very impressed. Eric, whose mother grew up in a Creole family in Belize City, had a great understanding of the historic and cultural currents of uh, New Orleans and the broader Caribbean that were woven into contemporary art. So I made a trip to see the installation in a warehouse in Central City. My first takeaway was that there was an incredible abundance in this altar a way of engaging the past to offer a new future which harnesses ancestral strength. Eric wrote in a review of the exhibit later, at fateful junctures of our past, 
New Orleanians placed their faith in the legendary voodoo priestess Marie Laveau, whose spiritual potency would surely be welcome in the fight for fair housing today. In that vein, writer and performance artist Christina K. Robinson has invoked Laveau's legacy in her Temple of Color and Sound, a movable voodoo altar where she explores the potential of strategic voodoo shrines as a new form of community-based arts activism. In fact, as an expression of the classic Creole synthesis of African, Native American, European spirituality that has spontaneously arisen among the diverse people here and in the Caribbean, voodoo was the original spiritual performance art of the Gulf Caribbean region. Unlike the sensationalism propagated by its critics, the true voodoo espoused by Marie Laveau was considered a sacred practice that united diverse generations of New Orleanians with the healing powers of nature. Hopefully her magic mojo can help heal our neighborhoods as well. Um, so Bruce, would you, in honor of Marie Laveau and um, the Temple of Color and Sound, play your song dedicated to Marie Laveau? Sure, you're right. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a song that I wrote for Marie Laveau, uh, similar to the Juan Samalu song. It just uh, showed up one day, so I was lucky enough to catch it and uh, pay attention. It's all about paying attention in the moment to, to be able to, you know, capture songs when they when they go passing by. So, uh, Marie Laveau. Marie Laveau, they would say that um, 
when she would have a pater, um, which is like a, you know, kind of a, a laid out spread for um, a voodoo altar that often people would play the accordion for the spirits. So the spirits love the accordion sound. So thank you very much, Bruce. And um, yeah, so Christina has done a, a, an amazing project around um, her a Republica, which has been put in all kinds of different spaces. I had an opportunity to see it at the New Orleans African American Museum in Treme as well which is a much more intimate setting um, in a 19th century home. And it was really powerful to see it in a neighborhood that had been so central to the Afro-Creole struggle in Louisiana and really around the country. So um, it's really entered into the city's imagination in a deeper way. And we're really excited to hear about it this evening. Thank you so much, Christina, for being here. Thank y'all for having me. Um, I really appreciate the invitation and thank you for playing that song. Uh, I really appreciate hearing that. Um, uh, so I guess I could start by sort of like telling you a little bit about why or how I started working in sort of this like uh, hybrid visual uh, medium. Um, primarily I work as a writer um, I write fiction and I write nonfiction. And sort of over the course of a few years, I started working a lot with communities outside of the United States and encountering obviously a language barrier. Um, and so I started thinking a lot about how I could work with some of the same ideas that I was working with in prose, but work with them in a way that sort of superseded your need to understand what I was saying and sort of also maybe supersede a certain kind of censorship or surveillance, thinking a lot about um, sort of the coded way that knowledge was transmitted over the course of history, especially at a point in time when, uh, you know, everything wasn't permissible in a sense. Um, and so I grew up uh, my whole life in New Orleans. Um, my family is basically from New Orleans, Mississippi, and also up River Road. So I grew up very much immersed in the Creole language, although I don't speak it. Um, I, I know certain phrases, you know, curse words, you know, jokes, uh, certain songs, um, but I don't speak it. But I love listening to it. Um, and I have a familiarity with it. And so I thought a lot about, you know, what it means to sort of be influenced um, by a language you can't speak, and, and but have it still sort of, um, you know, it be a part of about it be a part of the way you speak, communicate, you know, read, write, everything. Um, this uh, Black Studies scholar Fred Moten he talks a lot about uh, the concept of like the Black cosmopolitan um, as something that really began. Uh, during the Middle Passage, and he talks a lot about uh, the hold of the ship and the hold of the ship as uh, a language lab, essentially, um, where people were having to figure out a way to communicate with one another. You know, he uses this example of like a Fulani person, an evil person, and then trying to figure out how can we uh, communicate with each other. Then thinking about it uh, on the plantation, uh, site thinking about how Creole, and it was interesting that you brought up uh, that quote from the court records, right? So thinking about the Creole language as an insurgent uh, thing, right? And that to, to have a, a knowledge of Creole either linguistically or philosophically is an insurgent uh, sort of philosophy. And so that's kind of like the world in which Republica uh, emerges out of. So it's thinking about Louisiana as, um, or reimagining Louisiana, maybe in a more accurate way, right? So if we're thinking about that colon early, early colonial moment and some of the earliest rebellions in Louisiana being in 1729, 1730, 1731 with uh, the Natchez and the Bambara conspiring together um, to possibly overthrow this colony before it ever really even gets off the ground. Um, and so trying to think about 
Louisiana as really this Afro and primarily Afro indigenous landscape at the time with a very, very uncertain political future. So we were taught uh, American history, taught manifest destiny, and taught to think about all of um, what we see today as inevitable. You know, they teach it to you like, oh, it was inevitable that we would be in this place that we're in today, except it was not inevitable. You know, it was a series of uh, political actions and decisions that bring us to the point that we're at today. And any one of them could have gone a different way. And we may live in a, a radically different politically you know constituted situation so i thought about a lot about these early revolts between the natchez and the bambara thinking about you know the revolt in haiti french revolution you know uh the plots at point coupe in the 1795 and then finally thinking about this uprising in 1811 on the german coast and how it sort of was this uh climactic sort of revolt in North America um, after, you know, hundred, a couple hundred years of kind of constant plot um, and revolt. And so in this version of the story, uh, the revolt is successful. Um, and so I thought a lot about kind of what it means to uh, imagine a different present than you are confronted with and sort of what is the artistic and political use of imagining a different landscape than the one you currently uh, inhabit. Um, and so in this world, I kind of wanted to think about like just what everything would or what it could look like. What would it, you know, sound like, you know, what kind of food would they eat? What would the uh, ethnic constitution be outside of the one, you know, that was dominated by uh, the transatlantic slave trade? So it's sort of a way for me to reimagine society um, in many ways. And so it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an installation and performance project, but it sort of also is this uh, critical framework to try to understand um, this region of the country. And the vehicle for the critical framework is the temple. So the temple is the place that um, you came to visit. And I'm happy to, you know, know that you saw both of them because they were very, you know, different in thinking about how to inhabit the spaces differently um, was an interesting challenge. But the temple is the physical sort of manifestation of this philosophy. So it's the place that you can come visit and it moves around, you know, it fills the space that it has. So that means it can get as big as it needs to be or it can go as small as it needs to be. Um, and the person who runs the temple is a woman named Marianne uh, De Capita. And so Marianne De Capita is a character that I play in performance. She originally began as a character, a speaker in a lot of poems that I wrote. Um, and she sort of just leapt off the page like she wanted to be in real life. She wanted to be played, you know. Um, and I think about it um, sort of from a spiritual perspective that she, she, she really just manifested herself in the world. She was like, no, I don't, I'm not satisfied with just being on the page. So Mariam runs this temple and it's both a sacred and a profane space. So it, 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 it it serves the function that the people need. So if the people need a school, it can be a school. If the people need a nightclub, it can be a club. If they need a church, it can be a church. And Mariam is sort of um, adept at adjusting to all of um, these functions. And she herself, um, in terms of how she relates to her place of birth, which is Republica, is that she sort of works as this um, ambassador of a sort through performance to the rest of the world. And she's this bridge between the past, the present, and the future. So she sort of uses time travel um, to go back to the past and bring uh, the knowledge of how Republica came to be uh, to the past. And the temple itself is dedicated always to the memory of uh, the rebels in the uprising, and in particular one, uh, Kumana, who is uh, sort of Marianne's uh, guide 
uh, Kumana is one of the leaders, one of the main principal leaders of the rebellion. And they were born in, uh, they believed Ghana and at the time of the revolt had probably been in America less than 10 years. And so that was something, another part of the uprising of 1811 that was so powerful to me, returning to sort of this idea of the Creole as insurgent, was looking at how all of the people who participated in this rebellion came from um, basically every sort of category that a Black or African descended or Indigenous person could occupy at the time. So some of these people are born in Africa, some people are born on the plantation, some people are Caribbean, you know, they're varying ages and genders, and seeing how they were able to uh, sort of defy all of the tropes that we've been taught about organizing in North America and what the challenge was. Sort of like presenting this challenge that because we were different, we couldn't organize. And they sort of like blow that apart. Like they didn't even have to speak the same language necessarily um, to figure out a way to get this done. And so I started researching just the different sound mechanisms and things that they use as communication tools um, to talk to one another. Uh, thought a lot about Palmares in Brazil uh, as a sort of prototype uh, for a long-standing um, Maroon community. And kind of currently right now, I'm working on um, sort of recording and hopefully eventually filming and performing um, this sort of choreo poem. Uh, performance piece that's based on a lot of the research I've been doing. Um, yeah, so it's kind of what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I wanted to show you all one more thing if I had time. Do I have time? Okay. I'm going to show you all the map. Oh, it went away. Slow down. So, I wanted to show you all just the map um, kind of rep of Republica uh, before I close, because it's sort of very central to the idea um, that I'm working with. You can kind of see that it's an inverted uh, uh, cutoff of North America. It's a south up map. And that was really, really important to, to how I tried to think about how they would see and constitute this new world that they lived in, right? So the idea that uh, the way we have been taught to look at the world uh, based on this like European cartography is purely arbitrary. Um, you know, if you're out in outer space, it's not inherently true that the North is on top of us and the South is underneath us. You know, there's no up and down. The way this is represented in that flat map is purely based on the way Europeans saw the world. Um, so I looked at a lot of maps from, you know, ancient history and you see, you know, uh, maps that are more oblong or maps that are oriented like Australia in the center, outward. And so just thinking about how they would see the world they wouldn't see uh, it in quite the same way um, that it's represented today. And I think also just the inversion because we live in the current space that we do now, sort of trying to disrupt this idea that, you know, knowledge comes from like the top down uh, and really trying to think about how much this place at the bottom of the US map has influenced the whole country and sort of uh, a lot of the world dynamic um, kind of as we have it today. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it. But I wanted to show you all the map. Thanks. Oh, I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. I forgot that I was muted. Yeah. <laughs> On the website, are there any photos of the, of the temple? Oh, sure. Yeah. I could show you all a few, uh, while we're here. Where is it? So I have just um, some of the photos from uh, the Rennes to Dam High. So this is sort of um, some of the photo archive from that uh, version of the installation. And that one was in the gym in Crescent City Boxing Center. And I did it 
under this blue tent because I really wanted to think about uh, sacred spaces for uh, unhoused and displaced people. Um, so we sort of used this uh, big blue tent um, and put everything underneath there, just trying to think about like, well, where, where do you go with um, sort of the contents of your life um, and your faith once you're put out of every place, you know, that had been yours, you know, uh, especially thinking about now we're in August, this 15 year anniversary of Katrina. Um, you know, we've all sort of been on a really long winding um, journey and taken all of these things with us. Um, these are some of the photos from the African American Museum. Um, and we did uh, a version of the poem that I was speaking about uh, working on recording and filming that night. So it was sort of like a live performance of what I'm trying to kind of commit to film and audio. So yeah, these are just some of those. Um, and the, my website is christinakrobinson.com and I sort of update it with, uh, you know, as the project grows, update the archive. Yeah. Thank you. One of the things that I love about the um, the altar is your use of books. And oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm a big bookworm, read a lot, uh, taught English uh, at Xavier for a little while. I'm a writer, so I love books. And how, she, how that kind of works its way into the characters that one of the things that Marianne does in the temple is she does bibliomancy. And so that's sort of like her mode of uh insight into the future and so we do that sometimes in live performance where you just get a book uh you try to get yourself into a certain state of calm me too and you know we just flip and we see what comes up and it's okay. usually really like it's usually really relevant you know it's usually really relevant so that's where the books kind of play into the temple so so your future can be in a book in some yeah way or some I love or some that. insight, yeah, or some, yeah, either your future or some like really in, deep insight into whatever like your current mental state is or like whatever problem you might be like turning around um, in your mind. You know, typically people used um, the Bible to do bibliomancy traditionally, but I sort of like uh, kind of expand on that to think about other texts that have been raised to the level of sacred. So like, uh, you know, like Beloved, for instance, or Do As I, like you could totally do bibliomancy with Kelly Morrison. You know, at this point. So yeah, that's kind of where the books come in. Yeah. Wow. I love that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to ask what you do for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I know lots of people will have questions for you. Thank you all. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to find Connie on the, Connie, are you around? Yeah. Okay, there she is. Okay. Um, our, our next speaker is Connie Dorsey Abdul yeah. Salam. Um, and I was just going to yeah, do I'm, a short. Are you there? Yeah. I'm, okay, I'm listed great. as Nina. <laughs> oh, Nina. Okay, good. Um, yeah. <laughs> Connie, I'm just going to do a short introduction and then you'll take right. it away. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, I met Connie a number of years ago through our work with the Black Masking, also known as Mardi Gras Indian Community. She's a professor in the Department of History at Southern University of New Orleans, an archivist, a oral historian and curator, um, who has been engaged in public history in the city for decades, bring, bridging academia, high school classrooms in the streets and exhibits and public programs. But I really got to know Connie one afternoon that we spent together at Bullet Sports Bar in the Seventh Ward while I was going over edits of Le Coeur Creole. Bullets is a neighborhood institution uh, where the Neighborhood Story Project installed the San Malo Altar for St. Joseph's Night a number of years ago with the help of the Seventh Ward Warriors. Um, that afternoon, Connie asked me if anyone would care about learning Creole. And I thought that was a really valid question, a question that I knew Many people probably were wondering, but hadn't said out loud. With everything going on in the world, why are you trying to hold on to a dying language? I had learned to care about Creole by living in the Seventh Ward and hearing in so many interviews people say that they had heard their parents speak the language, but they hadn't been able to learn it themselves. 
Listening to the sadness of that loss, I began to think of Lakur Creole as a language repatriation project, a return of the language back to the parts of Louisiana where it had been lost in day-to-day -day life. And I had seen that happen when Bruce and, um, with the Sun Pie and the Louisiana Sunspots performed at Bullets, uh, and people began calling out phrases they remembered in Creole. It was really a special evening. Um, and being back with Connie in that afternoon, I was just like so struck when you told me that your family was from Bashery and Point Coupe and um, had spoken Creole, you know, while you were growing up. And so I felt this was a moment where like, I wanted to do some work together, you know, I was like, there, why, here we are in this moment in time. And so th this is our first opportunity where, I, I'm, because of coronavirus, um, can you, it says my internet's unstable. So hopefully um, not just like a, a jumble of words right now, but um, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'm so happy that you're here with us this evening to share your um, your work as an historian, a curator, and to share also a little bit about your family history. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, um, Rachel. You you can hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's 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 an honor and a pleasure. So. Um, Yes, um, I'm deeply rooted in Creole culture and language. My um, um, my father, he um, spoke Creole in the house. He and my mom, uh, he would really mix his English with Creole. And sometimes I say, you know, mom, what is dad talking about? She'd say, oh, he's just mixing Creole, Creole with uh, English. So um, my um, my grandfather, he's from um, Point Coupe, so you know that's that's deep in in Creole language there. Um, my grandmother, I can remember she, all my grandparents spoke Creole, and I can remember I can hear her now, you know, on the front porch early in the morning, front porch of her house because every summer we would visit. And uh, oh, it was such a pleasure to go to um, St. Rose, Louisiana, and uh, and visit. But early in the morning, her sister lived next door, and they on the front porch there speaking Creole, you know. <laughs> but it was something that you know, if we would come around, the children would come around, they would you know shoo us away, hush us away, you know. It was something that you know children you know was never involved in. And uh, my grandfather, who's, um, oh, his Creole was so thick. And, you know, his, his English was so heavy and thick that, you know, you couldn't understand his English because that's all he spoke was Creole. And um, uh, that was wonderful times too in, uh, in Lutcher, Louisiana. But he's, he's from originally from Bashery. And um, those was those were such wonderful times. I, I really enjoyed I, I really enjoyed um, you know going to my grandparents and listening to the Creole language. It's such a beautiful language. And um, my father, get back to my father, he um, since he spoke both English and, and Creole, you know, with still with my mom. Uh, within the house, he um, in the military, he was um, he was an interpreter because he could speak to Creole, and um, he helped his you know company get past checkpoints and so forth, and he was able to you know translate you know what he understood the French you know at that you know during that time you know, translate a little bit to, you know, be able to maneuver and, you know, uh, the company through um, checkpoints and wherever that are uh, the places that they had to visit or go to. So, um, but that was, that was my experience with, uh, with the Creole language uh, in my family. Um, but although, you know, we, um, I, I was born and raised here, we never, you know, we never 
learn the language. Although I can remember in elementary school, um, like first, second, and third grade, we, we learned French. It was, you know, not the Creole French because I understand now that they're there in, in the Lafayette region, they're bringing back that language, the Creole language. But it was, um, I can remember first, second and third grade, we, um, we was taught French. But um, I, never, I never really spoke the language. It's little small words that I can remember, you know, or can, can make out, but you know, I, I really wish that I would have learned, learned that language. But like I said, it was, it was a closed off language. It was a language that, you know, never was taught to, taught to the children, you know. If we, you know, it around, we would pick it up or something, but that's as far as, you know, it, it goes with that. Um, um, do but, you think um, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, do you think, uh, as you know, now that you're an educator, looking back on that, um, you, the, that they, the, the fact that French as a language was not permitted in the schools um, and was kind of outlawed uh, as a teaching instruction was one of the reasons why perhaps your family was not wanting you to speak it or... I, and you know, that's something that, that I often wonder about still today, you know, I, I, I really, I really don't know, you know, um, I really don't know, <laughs> but you know, um, it's something that, um, I, I, I just don't know why it was so forbidden, you know, for, mm -hmm. for children, children to learn the language, you know, we, if we, you know, hung around and, you know, it wasn't visible within, in, in within uh, adult, you know, range, maybe we could have picked up some like that, you know, but uh, to sit down and teach, you know, no, it, it never was, it never mm -hmm. was, um, it never was allowed. And like I said, it's something that I still, you know, often think about today, you know, yeah but um my um my project that i'm working on is a uh continuation of my graduate project um that i co-curated in 2007 and that project was um it was presented at the um the university of northern iowa and the name of that was um, Body Art uh, Adornment Across Cultures. And that project consisted of four components. Um, it consisted of um, um, body, uh, body piercing, tattooing, uh, hair braiding, and scarification. Um, my part in my part in that particular project was the um, the hair braiding. Um, what I did was I interviewed uh, hair braiders in the uh, Waterloo and Cedar Falls area. And um, I sit down and talk with them and their clients and, you know, to, to get a feel of how, uh, how are they coming up with all these elaborate uh, hair braiding styles. So many of the braiders, they, they never was like, it, it was something that they, a craft that they learned on their own. And mm -hmm. as far as the elaborate hairstyles that they would um, perform on their clients, they really had no, it, it was just something that they just thought of. So um, those, um, that was in the exhibit along with um, uh, their interviews. So um, the project that I'm working on now, like I said, is a continuation in its um, reclaiming our heritage, traditional West African coiffure. This is, um, this project can, is really like a, I would say a 360 degree um, history of traditional West African coiffure. 
coiffure hairstyles. So, um, and it contains, um, it's um, three components. It's a lecture and exhibit and a uh, PowerPoint slide. And um, it started out just as just something locally at uh, Southern University where I would photograph the students who wear the uh, traditional West African coiffure. And then it eventually evolved into a traveling exhibit in which I, um, in which I um, bought the exhibit and the lecture to two high schools here in uh, New Orleans, uh, St. Mary's Academy and also um, uh, St. Cats, formerly Xavier Prep. And the students, um, they, <laughs> they were very receptive and they just thought that, oh, it's just, you know, something about hair braiding, how to, how to do braids, how to wear different styles of braid. But the lecture is, um, um, like I said, it, it's a 360 degree historical lecture that begins with um, African hairstyles before the Europeans arrived. And it leads into the, um, the maintenance of hairstyles um, how African um, men, women, and children uh, uh, maintain their hair. And then it goes into the, uh, the Europeans, once the Europeans arrived, what the Europeans saw, although during this period, they did not take pictures of anything, but what they did was they, they wrote about in their journals and also drew, um, the things that Africans did on um, um, in their daily lives, and what fascinated um, um, these um, Europeans so much was that um, the hairstyles they often wrote and commented on the elaborate hairstyles that they saw. Now we talking about 15th century. 15th and 16th century Europeans um, voyagers um, who you know went to the continent of Africa, uh, mainly West Africa, and they wrote about and drew the pictures of all the elaborate hairstyles that they saw. And um, next, the lecture takes us um, um, takes the um, the students or the the audience into the um the slave trade once the slaves arrived in america they no longer could um, take care of their hairs they really maintain their hair or even uh keep up with the hairstyles that they once did in um in their country and um the lecture goes on to um, talk about um, after emancipation and also the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, how African hair, um, how African, African Americans assimilated to um, Europeans' um, standards of beauty. And then the lecture goes into the, um, the 60s, where the Black Power movement came back, came in, and um, everyone was wearing the afros, uh, going back to their natural roots. And then the lecture further goes into the the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and now the 2000s. So um, this is like you know the um, the 360 degree his history of. Uh, traditional West African coiffure. Um, the next part of the uh, exhibit, the next part would be the exhibit in which um, I use um, sculptures and figurines from Southern University's um, uh, archives 
And um, I use that to display, uh, to show the African coiffures that's carved into these figurines, um, the different types of elaborate hairstyles and braiding styles. Um, and also I photograph Southern students uh, around the city, uh, in particular Southern University students who wore the, um, who, who wear the, um, the traditional West African coiffure. And then this, I also so, uh, show PowerPoint slides of um, all the celebrities that are now going, going back to their natural roots in wearing the um, traditional West African coiffure. So that's uh, that's about it. But what makes um, I feel what makes my this project unique? I have read a lot of um, um, natural hair books, um, scholars, uh, scholars, and uh, novice, and um, they they have never touched on. Um, the type of research that I'm doing now, in which um, I have um, found these um, um, voyages or uh, these Europeans that have gone to the continent of Africa um, as early as the 15th and 16th century. And they have witnessed these elaborate hairstyles and drew them out and wrote about them. So, you know, that's, that's as far as I've gotten with my uh, research with this. And, and Fanny, do you have a few of the, earlier you were oh, showing us a few of the- Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, and this is a student who's wearing- uh, Lift it up a little bit more. Uh, traditional oh, yeah. Uh, West African coiffure, uh, the braiding, this is just a simple braiding style. But I juxtapose it with this to show that on the figurines and the sculptures, the same hairstyles. Wow. And I have, this is a student also and uh, which I photographed. And this, I found this picture here. This is a stamp that's in, that's from the early 19th century. So you see the similarities. So, um, you know, I, I tell these students that they think that they have you know, come up with something brand new and very creative. <laughs> but I tell them that, you know, uh, this is this is not new. This has been going <laughs> on for 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 <laughs> um, as long as we can remember. Like I said, this is a stamp and this stamp is from um, um, the early 19th century. Um, this is also a photograph that was taken in, uh, in 19, 1914. And this is a student who's wearing the same hairstyle. Oh, wow. And I let them know, I said, we have always, um, because they think that, you know, they're, they're placing um, beadwork and coins and the crowry shells um, attached to the hair, I let them know that that's not anything new. It's been going on. <laughs> 1914 and this is 2019. Uh, this is another picture. We see this style a lot. And this is a carving with a similar hairstyle. So 
So the students, the once the exhibit is over, or the and the lecture is over, they they're just so amazed and. It really surprised me how attentive there was because they were very, very interested in, you know, the traditional West African coiffure. That's fantastic. Yes, it is. And um, the research is still is still ongoing and I'm still, you know, photographing um, uh, traditional West African coiffure. And um, this exhibit came really, um, um, it was being shown really at the height of all the controversy that's going on in schools now. How students are being um, in violation for wearing traditional West African coiffure, how they're being expelled, how they're asking, how they're um, um, being asked to cut their hair, you know, and um, this exhibit, I'd, I'd like for this exhibit to, to you know, just bring uh, an, an awareness um, to um, not only the students themselves, but also to the public and to administrators that, you know, this is our heritage. You know, this isn't anything, you know, new or, you know, trending. This is, this is what we've always done, you know, from the continent of Africa, it survived through the, you know, the slave trade and um, after, after emancipation, we couldn't maintain our hair like we used to in, in, um, in Africa, so we was forced to assimilate to um, European standards and um, our hair is just not, it's just not meant to be like that. Because, you know, black hair is, is, is very fragile. We, um, in our natural state, black hair in its natural state, um, we cannot, uh, we cannot comb it with the regular comb. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's meant to be um, a wide tooth comb is, is meant to be used on black hair. You know, the, the wide, like the, um, uh, the pick, or um, like I said, a wide tooth comb. So, um, uh, like I said, um, I just hope that this, this, um, this um, exhibit, you know, would help, um, would bring about some sort of change in, um, in, uh, in dealing with, um, with black hair. And empower, yeah, and empower the next generation to feel confident about themselves. And well, the yeah, um, I, I think uh, I think the empowerment and the confidence is is there, you know. There. But it's, yeah, it's many yeah, yeah, it's it's right. It is it's the administration and uh, the authorities that that really need to to understand, you know, understand black hair. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing your exhibit and for your family history. It was, um, I'm so glad that we had a chance to get to know both more. Um, we're about halfway through our, pro our program this evening. Um, and uh, our next speaker is Mona Lisa Saloy, um, who uh, is a poet and uh, educator and um, folklorist um, that I've known for a long time. Um, I met Mona Lisa through one of her poems, My Mother is the Daughter of a Slave, that I saw on a broadside many, many years ago at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts, which had produced it for a reading that she had given. I was in my early 20s and teaching high school creative writing at John McDonough Senior High, and when I read it, 
I felt as if the city had opened up to me in another way. Her use of personal narrative woven through the history of this place and the details of the neighborhood made me feel a true deeper connection to where I lived. And so many of her poems are like this. When I had a chance to visit her home on New Orleans Street before Katrina, I walked up to the bright blue steps and stepped inside rooms completely covered with books. She's an award-winning poet and folklorist and wrote her dissertation on Bob Kaufman, a seventh ward beat poet, and has mentored thousands of creative writing students at Dillard, where she often helps students do the same things her poems do, trace lineages, find connections, and return to place. Um, before we get into Mona Lisa's um, work, we, we just wanted to honor her dad, who was uh, a Creole speaker himself with a Creole jazz song from Bruce. Well, Creole blues, uh, but it's the same. Tout la même, c'est la même quand même. Take it away from there. <laughs> merci, merci, mon frère et mon soeur. <laughs> ah oui, merci. Merci. All right. Thank you, thank you to the Neighborhood Story Project, Rachel, and Louisiana State Museum for having me. Thank you. Y'all, I'm native born and raised in the Seventh Ward, Black Creole. For those who may not know, Creole is not a color, but a culture. The etymological or earliest meaning is over 600 years old, invented by the Portuguese at the beginning 
of the transatlantic enslavement trade to define those descendants of mixed enslaved Africans born in the new world or native born. That's what it means. So I say black Creole since by the turn of the 19th century, some whites who were native born in Louisiana and attractive, perhaps even seduced by the beautiful culture our ancestors created here claim to be Creole. But in the majority of the world from the beginnings in the 1400s to now, Creole means black or part black. So it's at once a process of becoming, a language, and a culture. And it shares the African worldview of a divine God, family, and community. Of course, New Orleans is designed like most French cities into sections in Paris called arrondissement or our translation wards, designed by the engineer, Monsieur Poget, known as Pogger, the name straight, namesake of the downtown street or down river, where black Creoles were sent after being kicked out of the American section uptown or up river after enslavement. The seventh ward was home and is home to all kinds of black Creoles, folks from the fields or farms, plantations, later Haitians, Hondurans, banana boat, folks, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, Jamaicans, and others too, a, quite a melting pot of, Gracu, of Black Creoles. My aunt is Cuban. We, she just passed. She was in her 90s this year. We miss her. Now, geographically and historically, the second ward is, the seventh ward is second in size only to the ninth ward. It begins historically at the Mississippi River to Lake Pontchartrain, bordered between Elysian Fields Avenue and Esplanade. So, and the London Avenue Cornell runs through it from Gentilly, Dillard University is in the seventh ward, as well as a large part of the University of New Orleans campus near the lakefront. The fairgrounds, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival is there and just back from Esplanade, as well as St. Louis Cemetery number three and Frenchman Street where there was a lot of food and live music. So, Interestingly, the New Orleans and Pontchartrain Railway, which was the first U.S. railroad away from the Atlantic coast, ran for a century along Elysian Fields Avenue between the riverfront and the famous camps at Milneyburg. And so Black Creole settled all over this area. It's also home to St. Augustine High School and their Marching 100. St. Aug High led the way to battling segregation in New Orleans. Those successful legal battles were mounted by the school and another famous Seventh Ward resident, A.P. Turo, which resulted in the desegregation of high school athletics in Louisiana so that by the end of the 1960s, St. Aug teams could play against white teams from white schools. And famous St. Aug alums, three mayors, Sidney Bartholomew, one of the high dells what oh and somebody else i'm forgetting but carl weathers the actor stan verrett the sportscaster you see him on espn and louis Ubre, nfl players besides him many many and of course famous residents include jelly roll morton joe jones dr joseph harden who is ambassador to west africa the namesake of harden playground John Scott lived the greater part of the later part of his life there, although his studio was in the East. Blessed Henriette DeLille, founder of the Sisters of the Holy Family. Tyler Perry lived in the Seventh Ward. And of course, or Ernest Morial, the Haydell family, Heidel's, C. Ray Nagan as well, the Ruzan sisters, and Jermaine Basil still lives in the Seventh Ward, Sharon Martin, singers. Alan Toussaint lived the last of his life there. It's just so many people. And Jeffrey Poré, master plasterer, Daryl Reeves, we still have a blacksmith. The Black Indian groups, the Yellow Pocahontas, the Fayaya, the Creole hunters, the Hardhead hunters, the Seventh Ward warriors, and others. It was the home of Valida C. Jones Elementary School, founded for the education of Black children. The Seventh Ward is also home to Dillard University the jewel of Gentilly and the Emerald Campus of New Orleans. It's the oldest HBCU or historically black college or university in the state of Louisiana, founded in 1869 and recently ranked among one of the most beautiful campuses. 
we graduate more black physicists than anyone. And of course, famous, there's so many famous alums, but Ellis Marcellus, who we just lost, former poet laureate Brenda Marie Osby, and my former student, student who just won the Pulitzer Prize, Jericho Brown. We have social and pleasure clubs too, sometimes called mutual aid and benevolent societies. And these clubs began as, since the beginning because those were secret societies from West Africa imported here, those benevolent associations. And 19th century records show approximately 200 of these organizations with society tombs in two burial grounds, St. Louis Cemetery one and the Giro Street Cemetery. And that's just on this side of the river. So out of those pleasure clubs who are benevolent in their nature, it's no wonder that in the Seventh Ward alone, various clubs include Les Jeans Amis, the Young Men of Labor, the original Young Men of Illinois, the Plantation Revelers, and so many others. And so from Jelly Roll Martin to Louis Armstrong to Wynton Marsalis, these clubs supported the musical development of New Orleans by paying musicians to parade for them for many occasions. So holidays, funerals, weddings, births, honors, benevolent societies helped to nurture the development of music. Also called second line clubs, they dance in the streets to live music all dressed up to fly. And Louis Armstrong in his autobiography Satchmo said, I spent my life in New Orleans, but every time one of those clubs paraded, I would second line them all day long. The Seventh Ward is also home to the Martinez School where little kids learn five languages before the first grade. And if you didn't know, Seventh Ward is the home of the Who Dat Chant. Black during elementary days when everyone walked to school and the neighbors checked your bad behavior, then reported you to your parents where you really get it again for doing what you had no business doing in the first place. Not everyone owned a TV set. Those who did had to patiently wait for TV time after the news and those god-awful variety shows for grown-ups. By then it was bedtime. So left to our own imaginations, we filled time with sidewalk songs, jump rope rhymes, and clap hand games. There were no headphones, Sega games, no video arcades, no boom boxes, no CD or MP3 players, no Palm Pilots, no cell phones. This was before the mall, and most shopping was done downtown at back counters during Jim Crow. In many ways, it was a simpler time when parents walked their kids to school or to the bus stop because few Black folks owned cars. We lived in Black neighborhoods, shopped at neighborhood grocery stores, sometimes owned by Jews or Italians, sat in colored-only balconies at the Saturday matinee. It was just us kids. We had each other. We were creative and mostly we had good fun together. Our families during Jim Crow celebrated Saturday chores, Sunday family dinners or backyard parties, sometimes just when those who fish brought in such a catch of crabs, shrimps, oysters, and cowan, cowan, stewed swamp turtle that had its head cut off, its body hung from a fence for three days to drain of blood, then 41 meat flavors in the shell once stewed, and the tougher parts used in the soup, but the eggs separately cooked because it promised beautiful skin and eyes. And someone would just holler across the fence to one another. So by Saturday or Sunday after church, each family would contribute something. And sometimes we had suppers, we still call them, which are the equivalent of a rent party, but for a family's need. You turn a backyard into a nightclub in a hurry with cloth covered tables, a setup, ice soda cups, BYOB, bring your own booze or buy beer there. And live music, all the way live. Younger folks did waistline parties. The fee to enter was your waistline inches and then eat whatever serve. Cheese squares on toothpicks stuck to half an orange to look like a Sputnik. Sweet days. In those days, kids were kids and were not allowed to hear grown up talk. Often adults spoke Creole and did not teach it to us kids. So we wouldn't know what was being said. That was kapu or bad luck. And it was since we lost that a lot of language, it left us only with favorite lines, mostly bad words like gulifa or greedy or some I can't say here, but sweeter sounds in terms of endearment like bebe for baby, many, many terms of endearment 
or sayings like Lord TBB saying, let me tell you something. So Lord TBB, you can't kill bad grass from the seventh ward. Why not teach Creole? Like immigrants, our parents instilled American English for survival. Code switching was expected. You speak one way at home and another in the world. Definitely no backwater Creole, which was associated with enslavement era. Plassage, where rich white men kept black girls, black Creole girls by contract, a fake marriage. So the effort was for protection of black Creole kids' futures, much in the same way that recently immigrated Latino kids must learn English and are taught not to sound Latino, to blend in, to enable advancement, gain survival. Black Creole men mostly were skilled laborers or musicians. Mr. Pete around the corner repaired boots, shoes, belts, made belts, leather bags, or the Della Rose brothers have made fine men's shoes. My dad was a master carpenter and a jack of all trades. According to Jeffrey Porre, who's a master plasterer, does million dollar homes now, his dad and mine did work together, especially what we call coupe de main, all hands together. When someone needed a room added, all the skilled men helped. The women cooked red beans and rice and fed the men, and the men did the work. My uncles were, and, were bricklayers and cement finishers. Their sons, my cousins, did my driveway. My lovely house slab right now, the sidewalks of my current home built new. Some men were merchant seamen or worked the docks. Some were waiters in uptown clubs or porters on the railroad. The women sewed at Haspel Brothers, tropical seersucker suits, until the war when they made military uniforms. The first thing I learned to sew was a clothespin holder made to model a, a schoolgirl uniform with box pleats made from scraps. Our aunts did, some of our aunts and some women did day's work or were domestics for white or well-to-do Black Creole families. Some were modiste fine dressmakers, and they made wedding dresses or ball gowns of beads and lace or graduation dresses or dance recital out folks, outfits. And when folks get miffed, they throw a hissy feet, fit. Y'all is singular, plural, and we measure distances in minutes. Greetings include, how's your mama now? Oh, where you at? You heard me? And you'd better speak. <laughs> we all miss Lincoln Beach, then the colored beach. And we still attend talent shows at schools and worship in church on Sundays, if only virtually now. Folks still buck jump at second lines. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right is correct for most things. All right, so now I'm just going to share a few poems. And Rachel, I'm not going to do your favorites, but I wanted to share who we are now. But this first one is about then and then I'll jump to the present. God was willing, sis, I'm home. God was willing, sis, after 16 moves in 14 and a half years with 12 different addresses, I'm home. Rebuilt our little shotgun house daddy bought for $2,000 on the GI Bill post-World War II in the Seventh Ward. It was wide enough to love two families at a time, double long and wide like a bulldog, stocky with a sturdy gait, seemingly indestructible, with its turn of the century plaster and lath between walls, held by red brick fireplaces, anchors for kin, to hold on to steady, outlasting many storms from Betsy to Camille, hurricanes that came and went like occasional visitors who overstay their welcome. Here, we saved every book we ever had, from old Bibles listing births, marriages, deaths, to Sherlock Holmes and the Harvard classics, Two dictionaries, American Heritage and Webster's, plus the American People's Encyclopedia, who answered questions daddy or mother couldn't from the newspapers, the state's item newspaper, but especially the Louisiana Weekly, where Negroes had starring roles as newly married or debuted swimmers or meddled athletes in photos with their part-time coaches who were full-time teachers with their own kids too, but who spent their summers Saturdays and after school time teaching us regulation sports from baseball, football, swimming to supervise play where we were all a team and neighbors and grudges never lasted more than an hour 
or no longer than a busted lip that's gone when the swelling fades and heals like our sunburns in summers between thunder showers we see coming blocks away. Our shotgun castle, our guardian of refuge from those Jim Crow days in our neighborhood when we had all we needed for comfort and summer fun and winters without cold and no gunshots. So I thought I would try to capture a few things. I'm just gonna read two and capture what's going on now. And this is called Seventh Wall Daily Fair or Black Creole Talk Today. In the Crescent City, we live on the inside of good luck, the right side of blessings, past front porch steps and banquets where we're a giving thanks and praying town, contrary to popular opinion. There's more churches than bars. Annually, we count the storms missing us, laugh and thank you, Lord, for another safe season. In the middle of smiles, we see each other and wish y'all well until we chew the fat on the gallery again or dope hopping. Hey, he looks like Uncle Brother. No, he looks like Jesse Hill. Who that? Mr. Oop Poopa do himself. Oh, that dude bad. Buried in old Holt Cemetery. What? That's Potter's Field. No lie, that's Kapu. Bad luck. Uh-oh, got a step. Need to find a stump to fit and rest my rump. Choose some pecans later, yeah. You heard me? Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, and I'm gonna skip this one. This one is called Lockdown <laughs> 2020. Well, it's official. We marched into this. Everyone's on lockdown. Happy now? Even the Irish Channel had to cancel St. Patrick's Day bashes. COVID-19 more deadly than the flu, killing black folks mostly. Well, welcome to America again. No time to be incognito. Folks formerly too ashamed to admit they also do black talk among each other, tweeting their fantasy future of blackity where we can just be our beautiful black selves. Better wash your hands, keep your fingers out of your face, cover your muzzles, eyes too, and well, wash hands a long, long time. Then, singing all the birthday song got old real quick. So I jammed while scrubbing with the Dixie Cup singing, I go, I go, I go, I go on day. Jagamo fino anande, Jagamo fina ne, Jagamo fina ne. Only I sing the whole thing. Perfect for smiles and booty shakes. Maybe a bit longer, but happy all the while like Pharrell. Then by April, no Easter parade, no church baskets, no church celebrations. April, indeed, the cruelest month. Culture bearers not covered by anyone. No Black Indians masking, no Chawa on St. Joseph the Workers' Day. Hospitality workers out of luck. God bless them. Free Wi-Fi that sucks. Free movies we've all seen a dozen times. There's no restart to this leap year. Already years long, it seems, kids climbing kitchen walls and neighbor fences. Island, six, he says he's forgetting his classmates' names. My dog, Big Easy, wonders why I'm home so much. His sweet eyes speak, you again? What gives? My new perfume is hand sanitizer 2020. They say the Great Plague or Black Death was from 1665 to 1666, the cholera epidemic from 1830 and by 32 in the United States, the Spanish flu 100 years ago, and now COVID. There is some cause for celebration. Three black writers win the Pulitzer Prize in literature, and Ida B. Wells gets a special citation and $50,000 is forthcoming. Let's see, when did she die? Okay, it's been 150 plus days. So now for washing accompaniment, I graduate to another NOLA standard from the meters. They all ask for you. 
They all ask for you. The monkeys ask, the tigers ask, and the elephant asked me too. While scrubbing dirt and cheeky virus residue down the drain, gonna shake it all off, shake my shoulders in time, since summer comes a cruel second for the shake up of sidewalk, neck choking, lynching of another brother. So I celebrate in honor of George Floyd, Breonna Martin, Alton Sterling, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, and all those unnamed tragic deaths at the hands of racist cops hired to protect and serve. I'll sing my heart out while I can in case I'm next. I'm gonna lay down my burdens down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside, gonna lay down my burdens down by the riverside and study oh, no more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mona Lisa. That was amazing. You were right to do a poem for the times. We love that. Yes. Glad you're here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm honored. Thank you for being here. Thanks everyone Thank for being here. Um, I would like now to introduce uh, one of the founders of Opera Creole, Giovanna Joseph, um, who started the um, opera company with her daughter, Aria Monette Mason. Um, I met them both through separate circles, which is of course the way that New Orleans works, right? Like everything is interwoven, uh, but you know, sometimes you don't realize, oh, these are the, these are the same family until a, a little while later. Um, when we were first working on Le Coeur Creole, I attended a performance that Opera Creole gave at the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park. I was just blown away by the not only the singing, but the way that Giovanna framed the history of black composers in the city and their connections to the rise of jazz. Many musicians who played in the orchestra pit of the opera house went on to be part of uh, early jazz bands. At the same time, I had heard of Aria's work around education in the city for many years um, because she helped reestablish a community-based public elementary school where my son and goddaughter now go to school. The radical reconstruction that many Afro-Creole poets, activists, and composers advocated for in the 1800s is still relevant today, and in their operas, Opera Creole has brought these histories to life. A few years ago, Bruce and I um, were teaching a course on New Orleans public culture at the University of New Orleans, and we hosted an event dedicated to Bayou Road and the community activism that developed around the St. Rose de Lima Catholic Church in the 1800s. Giovanna had run the musical programs at the church before Hurricane Katrina, and so we invited Opera Creole to perform at our event. The setting was an old public market, market building, which had once been the Choctaw meeting ground, just down the street from the church that had welcomed a multiracial congregation, both enslaved and free, and protested slavery as an institution in the rise of the Confederacy. Giovanna and Aria held hands while they sang Ave Maria, and the music spilled out into the evening onto Bayou Road. People passed by, stopped at the door to take in this incredible sound bath, its own baptism. So we'd like to close out this evening by uh, getting to hear some of their uh, research and um, beautiful music. Hello, Rachel. Hello. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. You know, the New York Times referred to Opera Creole as making small steps at the dismantling the whiteness of opera. <laughs> and when we think of opera, that is what we think of as something that is not our music. It's something that is not our heritage. Uh, and the, 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 the plan and the mission of Opera Creole is to change history, is to bring real history to life, our full history, all that we have uh, given to America, around the world musically, and especially to New Orleans. Um, one of the things that we uh, are happy to talk about today 
is the opera that we wrote for New Orleans Tricentennial, that we wanted to take the opportunity to highlight these people that have been fighting for change, uh, who've been subversive to the system, uh, and, and get beyond this idea of Creoles of free people of color being uh, of elitist and not being invested in their, in their native New Orleans. So my daughter and I, Aria Mason, I'm so happy to uh, have her with me. We've been working very hard at dismantling the perceptions of what people of color have brought to the music world. And in New Orleans, music is our genealogy. If you wanna understand New Orleans, look at the music. I'm also very happy to have my longtime friend here with me, Dr. Marcus St. Julian. Uh, and it was his sister, Thais St. Julian, that actually gave me my very first piece of music by a Creole composer. And we have worked together over the years and he worked with me uh, on one of the uh, sections of this opera in the way that I wanted to open it. Someone mentioned Henriette DeLille and uh, we think of her as a potential saint. She is a venerable mother, Henriette DeLille, founder of the Sisters of the Holy Family. And if, she, and if she is canonized, will be the first African-American Creole uh, to be canonized as a saint. I wanted to open our opera with her because, or mem in memory of her, when Sister Juliette Godin sings about her and sings to her, um, because she was uh, a holy woman, but she was subversive. That she, she risked, and the other sisters risked their lives to teach the slaves to read. They risked their lives and, 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 and convinced uh, the, uh, our, our bishop that, well, how can they learn their, their catechism if they can't read? And they gave their lives to the poor, to the elderly, uh, you know, and it, this is, it's a very powerful group of black women. And in this era where we're looking at the, the joyous uh, rise of Kamala Harris's uh, new vice president, you know, presidential nominee, I wanted to start with this hymn that Dr. Marcus St. Julian actually wrote, wrote for Henriette DeLille, where he praises her as an example of, uh, of how we should be in the person that gives our lives as a, in service to the enslaved, to the infirmed, to the elderly. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful hymn that he wrote just about about just before the time she was declared venerable. So we want to start this. This is how our opera opens. It's 1863. The, uh, 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 the union has just come into New Orleans and the sisters are, are thinking about now they get the opportunity to prepare uh, the slaves for their freedom. They've taught them to read. They've, you know, they're preparing them for their freedom now. And so they stop and sing this in memory of Henriette DeLille, who had just recently died and did not live to see this, this portion. So it's in, it's in French, but basically it's a, just a wonderful piece, thanking her for being the servant of the people. Yeah. 
and die for God. That's what she says in her actual words. So the opera goes on to uh, talk about fighting in the war and, uh, and from France, Edmond Dede, who left New Orleans because he could not uh, um, realize the success that he wanted as a composer, he went to France. And in France, he found his um, voice in terms of being uh, in solidarity for protests and for the rights of others. He had gone down to Algeria and saw the Arabs uh, fighting against a British invasion. And so he wrote this aria that was to be included in his last opera, um, the, the, the Pledge of the Arab. And it's just a great piece that he wrote in the 1860s when we were in the middle of New Orleans pushing for our rights. Le Sermon de la Rave. there's no more noble thing than to chase the lion back across the desert. So it's a great, great piece of showing of our strength in classical music to still be uh, fighters of freedom. We all don't often think of opera in that way, but it is a, a, a really a wonderful way to think about it. And if nothing else, we think of great operas, opera stars just in standing in their excellence have made a difference in the perception of people of color. Now, New Orleans, unbeknownst to most people, is the first city of opera. The first opera ever performed in North America was performed here in 1796. And from 1796 to 1912, if I remember, there were five opera houses. 
and in those opera houses, free men of color were in the orchestra pits. So they, paid, they played these <laughs> wonderful uh, American debuts of French opera. They were educated in France and they came back to share their work here. But what was very interesting was after the Civil War, here we were in the pits, we were, you know, playing all this wonderful music, giving our, our own concerts, composing music, doing all these great things. Um, they decided they wanted no more of having us involved in the opera. And we, we could go to the opera before the Civil War. After the Civil War, they were kicking us out. So in our opera, we talk about one of these composers, Basile Barre, who was kicked out of the French Opera House when he tried to sit in the white section. And he and, and uh, uh, Eugene McCarthy were the first people to file a lawsuit in the country for the integration of a public performing arts space. So this was one of the uh, key, um, key points that we bring up in the opera. And uh, I come behind it with an aria that was written by Samuel Snyder, who was also a free man of color, and the manager, someone who became the manager, of the French Opera House, um, uh, and they put this uh, together. So it was white and black across, across, the, uh, across the aisle, so to speak. In about 1866, they wrote this beautiful uh, song called Sous Safinetra. So we're gonna sing a little bit of it. While he's looking for that, we'll talk a little bit more about it. So now, when we talk about people being, you got it? Okay. When we talk about people being uh, in the orchestra pits of the opera houses, to really make a, a, a clear point as to how many free people of color were skilled in this way. In 1840, the first independent orchestra was formed by 100 men, mostly free men of color and a few whites. So we were a significant portion of the opera and classical world of New Orleans. So here's Susefinator. <laughs> of time, I'm going to um, shorten some of the things that we're saying because I really want to talk more about what they're about. So Edmund Dede, who I mentioned uh, earlier, was born in New Orleans about 1827. He was a third generation free person of color. He was not of mixed race. He was considered a Creole because everyone who was born in the New World considered Creole. And uh, he is one of our most successful composers uh, that he wrote here as well as in, in France. Uh, about, uh, at least wrote five operas and six opera comiques and, and hundreds of classical works. This one is the very first that he wrote uh, and published and published in about 1842. And this is called My Poor Heart. And as Bruce would, might remember me saying, I think this is one of the first blues songs because he sings of this girl that he loves who just won't love him back. And, you know, just saying, if you could just, you know, deal with this fire in my poor heart, you know, just love me back. It's just really sad. 
but beautifully, beautifully written. So we'll do a little bit of it for you. That's definitely a blues song, right? <laughs> now, we talked about a little bit about heritage. Uh, the general and most important part of the story of Le Lion de la Reconstruction, the Lions of Reconstruction, as we call the opera, is the story of Dr. Ru Louis Charles Rudinet and his brother Rudinet, uh, Jean Baptiste Rudinet, uh, who got almost a thousand free men of color to sign a petition to Abraham Lincoln demanding the right to vote at the end of the Civil War, that all people of color would get the right to vote. They, they hand delivered it to Abraham Lincoln. Is this the story over here in the classroom? No. They hand delivered this petition to Abraham Lincoln. And he, um, after Frederick Douglass, who apparently had been reading Dr. Rudinay's newspaper here in New Orleans, Frederick Douglass spoke to him and said, you've got to take care of New Orleans. Um, Abraham Lincoln had a change of heart and talked about limited voting rights, limited suffrage. And um, the person at that speech was John Wilkes Booth. And he said, that's the last speech you'll give. And that was the last speech he gave. So that's New Orleans history. Um, so in the opera, we go through this process of signing the petition and bringing it to Abraham Lincoln and singing about our freedom and uh, just a powerful piece. I did this whole thing using some of the, the uh, free men of color, the free composers of color's work, as well as writing in some of my own. It wasn't until I was finished and saw the full petition to see my last name, Joseph, in one of the signatures. Two Josephs, two Augustes, which is also my family name. Um, so I was blown away that I may have actually been telling my own history. Um, we talked about the Creole language. My paternal grandmother spoke it. Uh, my maternal grandfather spoke it. And I'm told that they uh, flat out said that you were beaten in school if you tried to speak it. My grandmother really said that they, they beat it mostly out of her. So we did not get the advantage. Sometimes she would tell me how pronunciations of things might sound different. Uh, 
in Creole from the way they were in English or in French. And her mother uh, spoke Creole at home, said all her prayers in Creole, went to mass in French and Latin, uh, had an English employer. And so we as a people have been uh, amazing with languages. But I like to do this uh, particular Creole song that we also incorporated in the opera because it's, it's a look at um, one of the things that we are trying to work against in opera Creole, this idea of the, the uppity free person of color that's just, you know, just a show off and, and the enslaved person is looking at them like, you know, um, I'm going to make fun of them because they're just really not, they're not giving anything to what it is that we're trying to do here. So this is called Mishu Banjo, and we'll do a little bit of it. This is in one act opera, uh, and all of the all of the greats are in it: Rudolf de Jun, uh, Samuel Snyder, the composer; Basil Barre, the composer; uh, Edmond Dede, the composer, are are represented also in character in this opera. And we are expanding it. We really want to uh, incorporate more of the African tradition. We do have this is in a scene that takes place in Congo Square. And so we are in the process of expanding and looking at doing a book about uh, uh, the Black contribution to opera in New Orleans to really go through all of the operas that we composed and we presented over the years um, as, far, as far back as the 1860s. So it's a great and wonderful, wonderful history. Um, I would like to introduce my granddaughter. We have the Diva 3.0 <laughs> has, has come into the world as a miracle. She was born four months early uh, and was one pound, eight ounces. And she uh, came out of the NICU just a, about two weeks ago. She's now eight pounds, 11 ounces. And she is just fabulous and enjoying all of our singing and responding to it. So. This is Amara Cecile Josephine Mason Fols. For those of you just coming in, this is my daughter, Aria Mason. Aria Hi. Mason Fols. I'm Diva 2.0. She's Diva 2.0. I'm 1.0. I started the whole mess. <laughs> so one of the things that is uh, that you've sung for her is the Fe Dodo. Right. I've been I've been singing to her in Creole. I've been singing the Fado Do, which is Go to Sleep, a lullaby, in Creole, and I've also been singing Cher Mon Le Metoi, which means Dear I Love You So, and we go on to say Comte Cochon Le Melabu, which means I Love You Like a Pig Loves Mud. <laughs> so she is a Creole descendant, both on my side of the family and my husband, who is a descendant of. German coast settler Jean Jacques Fosse, who was an Alsatian. And so she has Creole blood on both sides of the of the tail. <laughs> and I have also been working on learning the language myself through um, Facebook groups 
and through the Memorize app, which I highly recommend to anybody if they want to try to reclaim some of their heritage language for themselves. UNESCO has declared the Louisiana Creole is one of the world's endangered languages. So it is up to us to try to reclaim that part of our history. Um, one of the things that's been our greatest joy is that some of the work that we've done has been nationally recognized. One of which is an opera written by the son of a New Orleans Free Composer of Color who was born in Paris and studied under, one, under the great uh, French composer of Massenet. And in 1903, he debuted his opera called La Flamenca, uh, and it never came to America. It was never performed here until we performed it in 2017. 2017. And so this is the work that we're doing. We're researching and finding those things that have been lost or rarely, rarely performed on the main opera stage. Or suppressed deliberately. So suppressed deliberately. And I have spent some time uh, taking part in uh, symposiums around opera and race to look at how things are being cast, uh, to look at who's being hired backstage, especially Lord Hair and Makeup. And, uh, and we're, we're, we're doing this work that you don't normally associate with opera, but we are so, certainly glad and blessed to be able to do it. So come out and see us. You see an opera Creole production, you go see the best looking colored people on stage. <laughs> because I don't play around when it comes to hair, makeup, or lighting. <laughs> and uh, something that speaks to historicity of the period that we're researching and the story that we want to tell. And we'll also entertain you along the way. So we're we so like thankful that, for this. And bien mesi. <laughs> On soit vous autres. Say goodnight, Amara. Anything else, Rachel, that I'm missing? Uh, it was fantastic. I'm so glad to see you, Aria, and since you've been a baby. Uh, yeah. It was a Creole, Julie Mombola. Yes. Merci, mon cher. All right. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Do y'all have some time to stay for some questions? If we have people um, that would like to uh, engage with the different participants, we, we have a little bit of time. We can open it up. Okay, sure. It was so much fun. Thank you, all of you. It was wonderful. <laughs> and the music, and I love the historical context. Thank you. And the hair and the performance. Oh my God. Thank you. I'm so honored Great. to be in this number. Thank you. Yeah, it was fantastic to hear the conversations that were woven through, you know, like, um, Sarah, are you here? I'm here. Um, um, do you do you want to open up the chat if people want? Yeah. So there's been some great conversation in the chat about that. I think the conversation continued. But if there's anything else that um, our panelists or other folks want to add in this section about um, the influences and origins of Louisiana Creole and distinctions from Cajun French. Um, and I'm looking to see if I miss any other questions, but please feel free to add if you have any questions, add them in the chat or um, unmute yourself if you'd like. I just got a question, will this recording be posted? Yes, you'll get an email with a link to this recording hopefully tomorrow and we'll also post it on the Facebook page. Yeah, well, well, just to answer the before we begin the, the, the broader conversation to answer the question about Creole and Cajun. Um, you know, C Cajun is a, um, a more a recent ethnic designation that came from people who were, oh wait, am I, am I... Okay, you left, you're gone. Oh. Am I? Now you're back. I, now you're back, yeah. Did I say anything or were I just uh, talking? We lost you. <laughs> okay, sorry. So just just before we open it up to the the general conversation, um, and, I, and I would love to hear our panelists be able to maybe talk to each other for a minute, but in terms of the question about C Cajun and, and Creole language, um, the, the, the Cajun language comes from um, the migration of Acadians from Canada from, you know, originally from Brittany through Canada that were expelled 
in the 1700s and were um, offered land by the Spanish colonial government. Um, and so they, uh, they settled in around St. James Parish and then in um, the in more southwest Louisiana and that language is connected to that history. And I think, um, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning, but also Mona Lisa spoke of it as well that Creole is a really a, a language that developed from enslaved Africans. And, um, and so the Although people have lived close together and there is overlap in the way that people speak, they have different roots. Would you like to add anything about? Oh yeah, you know, it, it's um, the Creole language uh, in Louisiana is, is not different than Creole languages um, all around the world, especially in um, uh, places where colonies were, so you could include um, all of Louisiana, uh, probably adjacent parts of Mississippi, uh, probably adjacent parts of uh, all, all of the Caribbean, um, Diana. Southeast Asia, um, West Africa, all of these places. But it is, um, th these are places where people created languages out of necessity, uh, Creole. Creole uh, being a, a multifaceted language that uh, allowed enslaved Africans to be able to speak a uh, language that was somewhat based off of French or English or Spanish or uh, Dutch or, um, you know, Portuguese uh, in front of um, people who held them in bondage and they couldn't understand what they were saying. So first, foremost, a language that was built out of necessity and defense, but Louisiana Creole is its own, its own thing and probably has at least two different branches. Mm -hmm. uh, that developed over time and the earliest starting in, you know, 17, 19 or 20, um, which some people years ago would call Mississippi Creole uh, versus uh, Tesh Creole, which was, uh, which they assigned along waterways, but it's much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. The people who, who have created uh, designations, but didn't necessarily ask the people uh, mm -hmm. who created the language what they called it, uh, just like Native Americans. <laughs> so, yep, yeah. yep, and I, I agree. I'll just, I'll just add one little thing and then I wanna just open it up to, to our panelists that, um, you know, when, when you look at the scholarship of languages around West African languages, um, most of like in Yoruba and LA and other West and, and, and also Congolese languages, articles are at the back of words. Mm -hmm. So, you would say instead of um, like uh, my friend, uh, friend my, right? And so when Africans were hearing words in French, they were still, of course, associating grammar patterns from their own languages. And so those things were transposed into Creoles. In, in Haiti, it's more direct uh, in terms, like you would say, Zami moi, and my friend that the moin would be at the back of the word. Um, but in Creole, there's, in Louisiana, there's all kinds of moments like that where it's a blend of languages. So you'll have an example where you'll say uh, la ri, and it's the road, but la ri is actually the noun. They're putting the article into the word itself because it would make sense like that in a, in a West African language. Yeah, it's the essence of Creole. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, the, the rhythms, <laughs> yeah, the rhythms are different. And also the liaisons that happen in French for French speakers, you know, you have the Z's that, that occur uh, in, not in the written form of French, but in um, the connections between articles and the things. Do you, so the Z's will get attached in, in Creole to the beginning of words. Les, les amis, les amis. Uh, I like that echo. <laughs> les amis echo. But add also that, you know, Louisiana French, which, which is what linguists now call Cajun French, and Louisiana Creole are sister languages. They share vocabulary. Well, um, yeah, that, that, those are two or three different things, though. So right, I, I yeah, they really kind of, are. Uh, but uh, but what I was going to say was that the whole identity of Cajun 
as this separate, totally segregated thing from a uh, Louisiana Creole identity is relatively recent. Mm -hmm. um, as, Actually, as not really. Became more racialized over time. Not really. The, the Acadians were free. The Black Acadians Creoles were descendants of enslaved. They weren't white yet. The That's Creoles it. were also right. free. Right, the thank you. They weren't white yet. <laughs> they weren't white yet. They got real white. <laughs> If you look at the documentation when they're first brought when they're first brought here, they're known as Acadian Creoles. Right. 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 So there was, there was no distinction of calling them Cajuns. They right. intermarried with Louisiana Creoles. And yeah, how eventually, many of them, how many of them know black Thibodeaux and God shows and mm -hmm. Roba shows? We are we are one people who speak many languages, but that's an important distinction to keep to keep in mind that we are all related to one another yeah that they become the light they become yeah. white over time yeah okay, yeah again as white people mm -hmm. and who hasn't said i'm hungry me <laughs> <laughs> that's how we say it <laughs> i'm hungry me <laughs> yep say it all the time that's right <laughs> No, we say, I'm hungry, me. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yes, indeed. All One right, of the interesting in some ways that my grandmother uh, would say things. I never, it was a while before I understood what she was doing in making the change of things that she understood and in Creole into an English word. Mm -hmm. So one day she said she wanted to take me downtown she wanted to go shopping. So it's like, okay, we're going to get on the bus, go to Canal Street. She says, I got to go buy me a waist. And I said, you can do that? I, mean, I thought, she was thought she meant a physical waist, but she was calling that a blouse. Yeah. So that yeah. was some way that she translated something mm -hmm. into a waist. Uh, and she then she would say, go save the dishes. Save the dishes. And, you know, yeah. different yeah. things like that. That's how and make groceries. Around. Yeah, make make groceries. groceries. It's from the, the translation of the Creole. Absolutely. Right, right. So it's, it's funny when you think back on what older people used to say, and to some people that's y'all talk strange, but it, it always it makes sense when you go back. I love it. Yeah. We don't talk about save enough. Mm hmm. Yeah. You know, save something, put it away. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> save, save the groceries now. <laughs> but what she was really saying was she didn't remember. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I, I study. and and so understanding, you know, the root of that was much more helpful to me because I was just like this those are two different two different things that she means. But <laughs> when my mother explained to me, you know, her first language is in English, that actually helped me a lot. You guys you guys are bringing back old memories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another one is the, the rest day, you know, to rest or to stay gets translated, uh, you know, where do you stay in New Orleans? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. To rest. <laughs> to rest. That's right. So, you know, a lot of um, Creole in Louisiana is spoken just like, uh, I mean, you know, it doesn't sound anything strange to people who speak uh, Black English and South Louisiana, because a lot of it is direct translations from Creole mm -hmm. uh, into English, and and even later, people created or directly translated things from Black English into Creole as well. So it can move very quickly between mm -hmm. both of those things uh, in many different directions. So. so Um, I, I was just thinking about when I taught at John McDonough Senior High, you know, which was on the edge of the sixth and seventh ward for years. Um, in the in the early two thousands, there was still like young people were close to the Creole language as well. So when they would write, they would use words like banquet and. Um, mm -hmm. Right. When, when they were comfortable, the Creole inflection always came out too, which was super. Yeah. Beautiful year. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I, I just, I'm just so appreciative of all of y'all's work around holding on and not just holding on, but like continuing to keep 
these um, ways of knowing in amongst us, you know what I mean? It, it really is a decolonizing project that we're continuing to do and we're constantly having to decolonize ourselves yep. from- <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. And I, so hip. <laughs> <laughs> I myself am like, like an ongoing project and I just like, you know, my, my time either with your all's art or in conversation or in, um, you know, Mona and Lisa's you know, ongoing engagement with the Neighborhood Story Project over the years. I just deeply appreciate how you've committed to place. Um, yeah. Do I have a question? Oh, no. She's just, a mute. Okay. Is there, uh, does, does other people have questions for our panelists? Because I don't need to dominate the conversation. This lady's talking, Reggie. She needs oh. to unmute. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. No, okay. <laughs> um, hi. Well, first of all, I, I want to thank you, you guys. This has been amazing. Um, I just moved here just seven years ago, and uh, my family is in the number one. And um, this has been imparting, and I just feel that you guys, all of you guys have, been, have blessed us with this yeah. knowledge. And I, I would love to also hear from like a lot of other um, Creoles. And I shared with uh, Dr. Saloy that my, my great grandmother was part of the Creole and the East Indian um, marriages. Um, so it, it was really neat when I did my own genealogy research. And so we were Labastries, Maturines, Richets. And um, I just never thought about doing this. And I think because of Corona, I guess if this is the silver lining in the cloud, mm -hmm. it was just to see all these folks. I mean, even though I don't see pictures and stuff, but to see people. So just a heads up, my grandmother migrated <clears throat> to San Francisco. So mm -hmm. my mother is Hawaiian and my father is from here. Um, and we go back so many generations, but you guys really, um, yeah. just the ideas of uh, Henriette Delisle and you singing it, I had just read about her, Miss Giovanna. And so mm. I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Um, just even, oh my gosh, Christina K. Robinson, you look like my little baby sister. I was like, I need to get Rosie here. This is amazing, you know? Um, I really come from a, even though you say San Francisco is diverse, when I moved here, I said, this was the San Francisco of the 80s here because this is true mm. diversity where we all could come together and not hurt each other and speak our mind freely. I was able to get this here for the last seven years. Um, July 23rd was my, my seventh year here and wow. I fell at home. Um, I'm, I'm just blessed and you, I want to bless you guys as well. Um, just thank you. I don't really have any questions. Just, I don't know. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, and I was able to live in my great, uh, great grandfather's house for a little bit. So that was kind of neat too. So Sweet. thank you. Sweet. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to take this time to thank you guys as well. Um, I just recently, and I was sharing with um, Mona Lisa Saloy that I recently inherited um, some, quite a few cabinet card photos of, from my grandmother by way of New Orleans. And most of them are from the 1800s. And I even have original midwives receipts and everything wow. like that. And one of them is a hundred years old where my grandmother was born and it cost $12. And so, it, you know, an original discharge paperwork from World War I and photos to go with them. So me being born in California, I'm not aware of my New Orleans heritage. My grandmother did share with me but nothing like you guys are able to bring to the table and is so important to us 
who come generations later and learn. And I just heard um, the name Day Day mentioned. Um, my third great grandmother is Marie Louise Day Day. And so, wow. And um, I know there's a connection. And yeah. so this is just a beautiful platform. I just really look forward to connecting with all of you guys. And when this COVID is over, I'm probably going to become a resident <laughs> for months just to sit at your feet and learn. This oh is God. so beautiful because I want to put a narrative to these pictures yes, and they're be. well documented in New Orleans there I can find them very easily um, and so much but I know there's more that I haven't tapped into but I was sharing that I want to get these photos in some type of form maybe not the original cards but some type of form back to New Orleans because what I understand um, they're very valuable uh, many don't ha have lost them in the floods, yes. but they was preserved mm -hmm. here in California, and they're clear awesome. back to the 1800s. Oh, wow. that would be yeah. great. That would be such an important part of history. Yes, it is, and I think it's not just for me. It's for everyone in that area and have a passion and a love for our culture and our history. So I really look forward to um, connecting with you guys. And Mr. Mark Rudine really got me started on this journey. And, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and I've been working very hard. I tell you, it is so fascinating. And to hear the names come from you guys, it's just mm -hmm. amazing that yeah. I want to thank you. Well, all the universities here have archives. Mm -hmm. And even the New Orleans Public Library has archives. And the museums, yes. I mean, there are a lot of people around that will be happy to help you. Oh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. it's just, well, I'm glad to. A I humorous mean, story around the uh, Rudinay family. I got to see the succession papers of Dr. Louis Charles Rudinay. Oh. And uh, some, um, you know, kind of looking carefully, flipping through, and is showing his list of patients. And uh, on the list of patients, I saw the last name Root, R-O-U-X, which was my grandmother's maiden name. Mm -hmm. And on the, on the on next to it, it said $5. So it was kind of what either he was charging or, or had, he had been paid or something like that. So I called my godmother, my dad's first cousin, who's my oldest uh, living relative. And I, I, so I told her the story. And the, I'm thinking she's going to be like, wow, this was 1860 something or whatever. She says, wait a minute. We have five dollars. <laughs> <That's priceless. laughs> that was a lot of money then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was. <laughs> um, I see you also we have a question from Desiree Evans. If you want to unmute yourself, feel free to do so. Thank you. Hey, all. Thank you so much for a beautiful presentation. I love learning so much from all of our different scholars and artists here tonight. Um, I actually was wondering a lot, um, it was mentioned several times about um, Louisiana Creole's dying language. UNESCO has, rep, you know, um, named it as one of the um, most at-risk languages. Have there been, um, I guess, attempts to try to bring it into schools, into um, different programs? I grew up um, in Southwest Louisiana, and so for Codafil was really huge uh, part of um, Codafil, which is like the, the Council on French Language, um, started in the late seventies. So we had a lot of French in the school, but it was de definitely like proper French and, and or Cajun French. So we really never had an introduction to Black Creole um, or language or culture, um, and so it's something I had to learn later, many many years into adulthood. Um, but and or from our uh, and from my parents and grandparents, um, like many of you, they spoke it amongst each other, but didn't teach it to us. My mother told me stories of them being whipped and spanked in schools for, for speaking Creole. And so when it came to our generation, Generation X and Millennial, um, we were just taught um, not to speak it at all. Um, and so it took a lot of interviewing elders to try to kind of find remnants of the languages. Although fortunately for a lot of us, we had Zotico, and so we learned a lot of our Creole 
from the music itself. Um, but um, again, no, there was just no way, places in school or, or academia, even at the college level, to learn. I'm just wondering if there are institutions or community groups out there who are doing that kind of work in Louisiana schools. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Um, I know, I, I don't know if programs to bring it in school, I know there have been scholars that have worked on uh, sort of like streamlining the, the Creole dictionary online, I believe. Like there's so many words and phrases and things like that that I know, but as a writer, I would always struggle with spelling, um, how to represent it in uh, my fiction and in my prose. Um, so I found that online, um, dictionary very helpful but I'm not aware of a pro like a formalized program in school right yeah yeah, um, yeah. I, I I'm not either but uh, I do know that in the um, Lafayette region um, they are bringing in the um, the K French into the schools they are teaching the children Cajun in in the Lafayette region yeah there was like no attempt at anything real. So it was very, uh, yeah. Um, I, I'll jump in here because I was the one who brought up the UNESCO piece. Um, I think that there has been more of a push, especially in the last five years, to, to kind of change the narrative, like I was saying, around Cajun versus Creole and what's native and what's not and Cajun country and all of all of this, yeah. all of the branding that we've been undergoing in the state over the last 50 years that has somewhat given a, um, a very narrow picture of what Louisiana language and Louisiana history are. Um, I think that there's been pushed to kind of lobby Cotafield to try to bring Louisiana Creole into schools as well as uh, ULL's program where they teach Louisiana French, also bring Creole is, as a academic program, as well as at LSU. Uh, my friend Christophe Landry has uh, an online website, Louisiana Historic and Cultural Vistas, where he uh, sells flashcards uh, in Louisiana Creole. And he also can teach privately online, but um, there, there's a Facebook group where we practice speaking in Creole with each other. Um, and like I said, Memrise, which is a free language app, there's a Creole language, uh, Louisiana Creole language uh, class there. You can also set your phone in iPhone. If you have an iPhone, you can set your phone in Creole now, so you can type in it. Um, I'd also, yeah, I'd also add that there's been a bigger push to adopt a specific orthography for Louisiana Creole rather than using a French alphabet, mm -hmm. using a specific alphabet to Louisiana Creole similar to Haitian Creole. So that okay. there's a, a, a kind of a breakaway of the idea that this is broken French or um, country French, or as my French teacher at Ben Franklin High School said it, yes, I called the name of the school out, that this is a bastardization of French. Mm -hmm. So, um, We've got much more to do. And I, I would personally now as a new parent would love to see other young parents in New Orleans banding together to try to get the language back into our children because that's a great reclamation of culture there and for us young people mm -hmm. to be able to speak yeah. with each other because that would be such a resurgence of culture and not tying so much into you know, phenotype or skin color or some of the stereotypes of what it means to be Creole that we need to leave behind, but rather the reclamation of our culture through our language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So keep lobbying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In um, so in Le Creux Creole as well, we've used um, the, or the pan Caribbean orthography that's developed with the Louisiana Creole Dictionary. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been a, a bunch of different attempts to try to render the speech. And what happens in, if you use the French orthography is because there's so many silent letters in French, you can't really capture the nuances of and subtleties of the Creole language through it. Exactly. So um, I, what Aria is, I, I think what you're, you're talking about is that it's a phonetic alphabet for the Creole yeah. language and a exactly. Pan-African one. And that's yeah. what we when Bruce and I began to um, transcribe the lyrics for his songs 
and the traditional Creole songs into Creole and then translate them into English. Neither one of us knew how to, to write in Creole at all. And um, huh. so <laughs> we, had, we had to learn <laughs> our... Well, no, well it's true. We, it was like a it's big standard. project for us. And at one point, I actually went to Haiti for two weeks and studied with a tutor yeah. who um, was fluent in French and English and Creole to be able to help me be able to just tune my eye and my ear to be able to do the editing. I'm so used to editing in English that uh, we, we missed a lot of things. Um, and our other partner on that project, Leroy Etienne's first language is Creole, but he, uh, he never wrote it, you know, and he never learned French in school. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the, um, yeah, it's a, sometimes you like it's oral. Yeah, it was, it was an oral language. It's still a yeah. language, like a maroon language. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so in, in, if you're interested in that kind of conversation, Christina, about the language uh, conversion stuff, um, we, in, in Le Cur Creole, we try to like do some introduction to that. And then the songs that Bruce performed tonight, we've transcribed into Creole and translated them into English using that pan-Caribbean orthography, uh, which is cool because if you, I th um, you know, when I was in Haiti, people were saying like they had learned to write in French, but then with the rise of WhatsApp and like all mm -hmm. the social media, they learned to write in Creole. Like we, it's like kind of what um, Aria is saying, we can do it. It is possible to make yeah. another. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, conversational, conversational Creole, um, and you know, and, and it's you have quite a bit of that, you know, around Lafayette. It's not as much in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Creole um, New Inc. News. Creole Round Table, where you just sit and have a conversation and, and Creoles to to get and, and the moon and the trois quatre quatre moon qui qui parle Creole uh, just pour dire quelque chose uh, à jour. Ça c'est ouais. deux, deux fois deux, deux mois. Il était fait comme ça. Creole uh, Inc. also Herb Herb Wilkes, um, you know, has done some tremendous work um, starting in the 1970s, uh, and he speaks a very beautiful uh, Creole Southwest Louisiana Creole. Um, so there are folks that. Uh, have done that now again. It hasn't happened, and there's there isn't as much of a monthly conversational Creole uh, where people sit and talk uh, happening here in New Orleans. But I've got a feeling even the two is all over that, so it's gonna happen. We're very live. See, like I said, the three divas is gonna be in on it too. So. Um, yeah, and also I would just like to weave in you know what christina was saying earlier in the um panel about creole being another way of knowing so what do we lose when we lose a language like we lose more than just the words we lose the grammar of other epistemologies and so in my you know i think at this moment in time there is a bit of a resurgence to um not just preserve the language but the ethos behind it, which is a radical ethos, and we all can benefit from understanding the the way that a, a language works in a particular context, you know, of South Louisiana. So I, I really appreciated that as a, a kind of a current through our panel this evening. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I know it's getting late and some people may be having I'm a fading. Day. I'm fading. I'm an early riser, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> Mona Lisa told me we had to start early. <laughs> yep, I'm up long before dawn. But I wanted to say also, I went back into the Creole because of Edouard Glissant, who was at LSU when I was teaching there and as a graduate student. And I ended up translating a big chunk of one of his books. And of course, I lost everything in the flood, but I just found some pages of it. So, because yeah. I everything I tried to save everything that I could, and, and much of it I couldn't. But boy, so I think I want to. If I, I might only have enough for a chapbook, but it was very 
because he's from Martinique, but it was Creole. It was not yeah. French. Right. And mm -hmm. so, boy, I did a lot of work on that piece. And so, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I appreciate what everybody's doing because we have to tell our stories and Absolutely. we have to tell it right. And right. the way it was meant to be told. And we have to capture this as part of our history and an essential part of our culture, culture and who we, we're here because of them. So mm -hmm. it's a, an important tribute. So thank you, Rachel. And thank, thank, you thank you all. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. I really <laughs> learned so much tonight and I, I do appreciate you. I'm, I'm not Creole, but I have great, great honor and respect and love, particularly for my friend Mona Lisa, who I went to college with. I'm here in Washington watching you all um, there. And so thank you for giving me such a wonderful treat tonight. Jeanette Martin, you are Creole. Her dad is from here. He's a black <laughs> Creole from here. My mother might be Filipino. Hey, Mona Lisa, she's we from, can read. She, she's she from didn't here. Us at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mona Lisa, well, you guys, when I come there, you will all adopt me and then I will be, then I will feel that I'm qualifiable. And look, so, Rachel, her dad looks a lot like mine. Exactly. <laughs> 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 bye bye, so all. <laughs> Great to see you guys. Oh, all right. Thank, thank you. you uh, appreciate it. Yes. Thank all you all Seattle. so much. She's in Seattle. <laughs> yeah. And Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, cool. <laughs> the, if you are in New Orleans, the exhibit is open for just a few more weeks at the Cabildo. Mm -hmm. And we're practicing social distancing. Come wear your mask and come check it out. Um, What's the name of the exhibit? An, um, Le Coeur Creole. Yeah. Um, let me give you the full title. Um, Runaway Slaves, Music and Memory in Louisiana. And it is yes. a beautiful exhibition that Rachel and Bruce have put together that yeah. weave together yeah. these stories of language and music and history and art. Awesome. Um, we also have another event next week, next Thursday, a week from today, with Sarah Broom, the author of The Yellow House, another oh. dive into Louisiana family and genealogy and history, and she'll be in conversation with Leslie Harris, okay. um, a historian. So come on back, <laughs> and hopefully we'll see you in a week. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you to our thank wonderful you. panelists for an amazing yeah, conversation. Thank you. thank you. It was great to meet y'all. <laughs> thank you. I thank really you. enjoyed it. I look forward to learning Creole language. I know that my maiden name is French, is Charlo. And I've always, uh, you know, wanted to learn more about the Creole history. So I truly enjoyed it. I enjoyed Char everyone That's sharing their history. Yeah, we know Charlo. Charlo is my best friend's last name, and there's a street in Paris, Rue de Charlo. Went to take a wow. picture in her honor. I'm going to have to Google that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank you all so much. All right. Thank you for being welcome. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>